Welcome to Concussion Stories, a Life Yana podcast series filled with hope. I'm here to let you know that you are not alone in your concussion recovery. I'm Melanie, and I spent more than six years experimenting, training, and learning in order to heal myself from a very bad case of post-concussion syndrome. And today, I feel better than ever before. In Concussion Stories, we dig deep while discussing hopeful stories of recovery, as well as the hard stuff in the messy middle. If you're struggling to focus, be sure to take a break. Down in the description of each episode, you can find a table of contents in case you want to skip ahead. Let's dive right in. I'm so happy that you tuned in for the second part of my conversation with Professor of Neuropsychology, Lindsay Wilson. In the previous episode of Concussion Stories, we already covered the first part of this interview. So, of course, I already introduced Lindsay to you before, but I will just do a short recap. Lindsay is Professor of Neuropsychology at the University of Stirling in the UK, and he is also part of Center TBI, the enormous research group that's been studying traumatic brain injury for the last 10 years already. So that's how he is related to Emeritus Professor Andrew Maas, whom you can listen to in two previous episodes. As a neuropsychologist, Lindsay talks about the emotions and side effects that come with concussion. I can't wait to share all the recognition and acknowledgement that he is able to share with us today with you. So without further ado, let's start where we left off the last time. Traumatic brain injury has been caused a silent epidemic because it's, it consists of uh, changes and disabilities that are not obvious to other people. So that is that's certainly a, a key issue. Um, yes. And part of this is uh, people people with traumatic brain injury understanding that they they may need help and they may they should seek help and also. Uh, involve the um, the relatives and, and carers so that they they are they're fully they're informed about about the kinds of changes that might have taken place. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then um, sometimes it's hard for people around them to understand because their lives continue. So mm-hmm. um, it's hard to stand still and to really be empathetic about what someone else is feeling. Of course especially if it's invisible. As a neuropsychologist, do you have any way in which people can um, maybe take the time or take a moment with other ones and make clear that they need some time with them and some understanding? Um, yeah, it, 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 there's, the key thing here is, it, is the insight that the person has into their own difficulties and how they how they manage them. Um, and some people will understand understand what their difficulties are and will be able to tell the relatives, look, I'm, my memory is not as good as it was. Sorry, I forgot your birthday, but uh, it's just the consequences of the traumatic brain injury. But others, others struggle with this. And so I think... Um, Getting help of of one kind or another, another uh, which can be counselling or other other types of uh, uh, direct help that is aimed not just at the, the the person with the brain the TBI but also to to relatives and people around them. I think that can be really helpful. Yes, I think that we absolutely agree on this. That the the absolute worst thing that you can do, even though it's really hard to ask people for help or to ask people who aren't as empathetic for help or to ask people who are living their lives and didn't even see what was going on for you uh, with you for help, uh, it's the worst to do is not ask anyone or not even try because that really stimulates the isolation. And the most important thing you can do is reach out and find who's best for you uh, to help you, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, it, um, and what, what, what you're referring to really are coping strategies and things that are positive and positive ways of dealing things, which are uh, very important uh, after brain injury so that, that people uh, identify the kinds of problems they have and use constructive uh, problem-solving ways of, uh, of dealing with them. 
rather than just putting them aside or uh, denying them or uh, not telling relatives that they're so, that they have difficulties. Yeah, that's what I did. That didn't help. And um, yeah, it's um, it's really hard. And I I know for people it's really hard. Um, can you to make it more practical? You said that um, you talked about coping strategies. Uh, can you tell our listeners a bit about what they are and why they are so important for concussion recovery? Yes, I mean, coping strategies are are the ways that we deal with stress in our life. And so everyone has coping strategies that they, that they use and apply. And um, some coping strategies are, uh, are helpful in the long term, such as uh, trying to identify the source of stress and dealing with it, uh, trying to uh, minimize the, 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 the stressor itself. Another uh, positive thing to do is to adjust uh, um, adjust your own uh, emotional reaction to stress so that you're not uh, taking it as badly as uh, as you might have before. But certainly the th- the ways that uh, are less positive or uh, uh, called maladaptive coping include things like just ignoring problems or uh, um, hoping they'll go away uh, and generally uh, not 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 doing anything but just uh, and and you can get some comfort very in the short term from from such strategies but they don't but the end you end up with with a greater problem down down the line so coping strategies and and having positive uh, adaptive coping strategies is, is really important in terms of solving the day-to-day problems that arise after uh, after uh, TBI, if any severity. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, this is very uh, recognizable, I believe, uh, for a lot of us, um, especially yeah, for me, uh, very much so. Um, my worst coping strategy was uh, I was uh, eating in, a, uh, in such a way that I would get so tired of eating, so I would eat so much that I would fall asleep. And then I would spend time sleeping instead of hurting. And um, that's a, another example of a very maladaptive uh, strategy because in the end I had to clean up all of that mess as well because I wasn't healthy uh, afterwards. Um, and also you have to unlearn all of the uh, cravings and all of the things uh, that you create with such a strategy. Whereas if, if I would have, instead of eating, I would have uh, gone for a walk every time I wanted to eat, for example, uh, I would have stayed fit. I would have saw seen sunlight. I would have maybe talked to someone um, and would have gotten into touch with people. And that would have been more of a yeah, <laughs> a constructive uh, coping uh, mechanism. So uh, yes, these are very, very important. And um, I yeah, think... Exactly. Yes. Well, thank, thank you for that's that's a very nice. Uh, I mean, it's a very nicely told uh, example, Melanie, of uh, the way in which these things work. And and uh, undoubtedly, if people um, ad- adapt more positive strategies, then then the the problems can be diminished. Yes. Uh, yeah. Indeed. And uh, also, if I would have done this, I would have recovered also so much faster. So that's really the importance of um, of coping strategies. Um, it's really nice to talk about this with you um, because during my recovery process, I, this was also the first time um, that I talked with Andrew Mass. I also had this experience that, wow, um, someone who studies this field recognizes everything that I talk about. <laughs> it's a really um, a miraculous experience for me because all of these years I felt like the computer says no with the doctors. I felt like I was talking to a wall and uh, let alone emotional uh, recognition. That's, that's something that's very new to me and I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, there's 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 an education education that needs to be done among doctors as well because um, they're often not aware of the kinds of problems that people have. 
uh, after after traumatic brain injury. I mean, a, a GP, for example, will only see a relatively small, small number of people with TBI, so they can't really be expected to understand the understand the condition uh, very 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 clearly. No, and I also understand that from neurologists who see a lot of people with traumatic brain injury, they have so little time. They have to uh, adhere to protocols because otherwise mm. everything will be a mess as well. And for so long, there has been so little research into brain injury. So it's really good that you have been doing this project, Center TBI, for so long already and that you've gathered so much insight. Uh, everything is starting to change. Uh, but still, it needs a long time also to really uh, get into direct patient care, of course. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, these are uh, I'm, the Center TBI project has been very successful in terms of uh, advancing understanding, but there's still quite small steps because, as I say, the, the brain is such a complicated uh, organ and. Uh, the whole of traumatic brain injury and the way it affects people is such a complicated uh, uh, business. Mm -hmm. Yes, but there's a lot of uh, reason to be hopeful. And in the meantime, um, we still have these kind of conversations and a lot of materials also in Liviana where we can help uh, people move forward already with everything that we learned in the, in the meantime. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, there's this abbreviation that you use in your research. Um, I'm going to look it up. It's H-R-Q-O-L. Okay, right. <laughs> I was very interested in this. Um, can you tell health. me about Okay, the, the H-R-Q-O-L stands for Health Related Quality of Life. So quality of life is just a summary of everything uh, in your life and how you feel about it um, what your quality of life is consists of different things for different people but uh, at the end of the day it's somehow a summary of uh, generally how you feel uh, about about your life positive or or negative and the health related part is the implications of health conditions for that uh, for that positive or negative feeling about life so health-related quality of life is a way of summarizing the effects of traumatic brain injury, but their effects specifically for the person themselves about how they feel about it, their, their perspective on, on, uh, on, on the consequences of, uh, of the TBI. Hmm. And what yeah. have your um, main findings about um, quality of life and concussions or maybe traumatic brain injury a bit broader been um, well the one of the one of the key things is uh, like other areas is that people's health related quality of life can be impaired after after a, a quite a minor injury so you find people with uh, poor quality of life for one reason or another um, after mild TBI, and trying to understand why they they have uh, they have poor quality of life is one of the ways in which you can get at the kinds of problems that they might be suffering and the way that that you might you might help them. But on the other side, we also find that people with severe TBI often have quite positive quality of life, even uh, even people who are left. Uh, Severely disabled after injury can have can have good quality of life. So that's a very that's actually a very positive message, and, and it's an important one uh, for people treating TBI not to feel that the that the inevitably people are have poor quality of life because that certainly isn't true. Um, mm. That's very interesting. Do you know um, Professor Stephen Joseph from University of We? Nottingham? I don't remember exactly which university he is on. He's, um, uh, I think he's a psychiatrist, but um, he has written about um, overcoming trauma. And um, he has written a lot about people who have 
suffered so much adversity and have come out in a way that they describe that they are so much happier and more fulfilled afterward. And this to me was reading this really helped me find a way because I wanted to have that. I wanted to have my uh, stupid accident and all of the shitty results to, to make, build a greater life. And yep. it worked in the end, but it gave me so much hope. Oh. And it's really beautiful that if you say this about the severe severity of the injury, that people can even have a higher quality of life. It makes me think of that. Absolutely. I think it's a very important uh, message uh, for for people after TBI that uh, you, you, you can uh, have a very positive life afterwards. So even if you, even if it's a severe TBI and you suffer a, a quite uh, severe disability functionally, you can still have a very positive uh, life. Um, so I, I mean that, that certainly I think is important. And many people just do describe uh, uh, some of these positive things from uh, coping and uh, with their, with the effects of TBI. Yes. Yes. So is that something that you discovered that the, uh, the health related quality of life increases when people's coping mechanisms become more constructive? Um, that it's not something that we've studied in Centre TBI, but yeah, that's right. That's that's certainly what people find that uh, if you use positive uh, coping strategies, adaptive coping strategies, your 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 quality of life is better than if you're you're using uh, so-called maladaptive strategies like avoiding things or uh, denying yes. them. Yes. So in that way, it's really uh, it will make pe make people. It will make help people feel so much more optimistic about their outcome right away, instantly, almost, uh, if they start using constructive um, coping strategies. Yeah, it can make people. It gives people the sense of uh, of being in control of, of of what's of what's happening to them. Yeah, absolutely, and so it can immediately give a more much more positive uh, uh, perspective on things. Yeah. That makes something as abstract as uh, coping strategies uh, very fun <laughs> right away. <laughs> yeah, it gives power right away, I think. Um, let me see. Um, I'm just looking through my questions real quick. Um, yeah, my final question for you. Um, what is your hope for the work you do with Center TBI? Um, what would you like for it to bring about? Um, well, I think I think we can get uh, a better understanding of the uh, traumatic brain injury. And I think particularly mild traumatic brain injury, because uh, what we see in in the center TBI study is a large uh, proportion of uh, mild, uh, supposedly mild TBI. And I think I think uh, the study will yield uh, new insights into into mild TBI. And one of the nice things about Centre TBI is that uh, it's such a large study, and it's also there's also a parallel study in, in the United States called Track TBI, with, which is another large study. And if both these studies get the same results, then that's that becomes quite influential for people in the field, and they uh, and people begin to to to, to, to take notice. Uh, and I think that that for me is one of the really uh, optimistic things about about the about center TBI is that it can really it can really change people's opinion about uh, because of the, because it has the, the, the enough weight uh, it carries that 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 uh, weight to make people to change people's minds. Mm. That's um that's a wonderful perspective, and. Uh... It, it stands out to me that you say change people's opinion. It really feels to me like that time when people still felt that the world was not round and then people <laughs> knew in the end that the, round, the, the world was round. Um, 
it's a really uh, strange era that we are in right now, I think, that we may look back on later and say, wow, we really didn't know a lot about it. Yeah, absolutely, Melanie. I think that's right. And certainly the brain is, is one of these uh, largely uncharted uh, territories that uh, we're still just exploring and we're just really beginning to understand. Mm -hmm. But you're moving forward and I really want to thank you for bringing the psychological side effects of TBI out in the open and making the way that we feel um, more human and also working hard in the end to change the protocols and change the opinions, as you say, um, so that people will feel that they are recognized, but also that you in the end help people recover and feel better. So I want to thank you for that and for your time with us today. Well, thank, thank you again for inviting me, man. It's been a very interesting uh, conversation. It's been for me too. Now I would love to hear from you. What do you take away from this episode? Is there something that you can apply to your life right away? Head on over to lifeyana.com and leave your comment now. And if you want to hear and read more concussion stories, actionable steps and inspiration, be sure to subscribe to the Life Yana email list while you're there so that you never miss out on new materials we constantly make for you. And if you want to support this podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash concussion stories. Thank you for listening to this concussion stories episode by Life Yana. May you be well and may you be happy.